We're glad that you're here again this morning. If you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, again, I know, again, uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Um, I just, I'll be totally transparent with you this morning. My intention this morning was to have this sermon uh, text be Mark 12, 35 through 44. That was what I studied most of the week. That was my intention. Uh, that was my goal. I'm honestly and truthfully trying to move quicker uh, through the Gospel of Mark. Um, I, it's, I'm, that's true, Matt. I really am. And what I realized was that I wasn't going to get past verse 37 this morning. Um, and there's a few reasons why. Uh, one, because I think the questions that are asked in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37, are questions that are literally being asked in the minds and hearts of people today. Um, does it really matter if we get right who Jesus is? Does it really matter if we have an understanding of who the Bible says Jesus is? Or do we just have to believe in a Jesus? Is it okay to, to construct the Jesus that we want in our own lives and believe and trust in Him? And if we call on the name of the Lord, we'll be saved. Is that okay? Or does it really matter, eternally matter, if we understand who the Bible says Jesus is? And I think that those questions are questions that, one, are answered in this text, and two, are being questioned and asked by people um, all over the world, and certainly in our country today. The other thing, the other thing that hit me as I was studying... I. I knew that um, one of the verses that Jesus quotes uh, in this text that we'll read this morning um, is, is a heavily quoted verse, and, and probably we've heard it many times. But what I didn't realize until I was studying it was that uh, Psalm 110.1, which Jesus quotes in this text that we'll read here in a moment, is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. There's no other Old Testament verse that is quoted or referenced more in the New Testament than this one. And it's, it happens over 30 times. Over 30 times, this one verse is mentioned in the New Testament. And as I was reading that, I thought, that's probably important, <laughs> right? If, if, if that many New Testament writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit to quote this verse, Maybe we ought to slow our roll a little bit and make sure that we study this passage of Scripture a little closer. So, hopefully you'll forgive me for only getting through three verses this week. But, uh, God's perfect and inspired word says this. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is it? How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And so we have an interesting place here in the passage of Scripture. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, what you know is that Jesus is being questioned. The Scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, uh, all of them are questioning Jesus with, with varying levels of contempt or uh, care about what he says. But nevertheless, Jesus is being questioned. He's been asked questions over and over again. And, and every time, as we would expect that he would, Jesus gives the right biblical true answer. But now Jesus turns the tables on them. Now Jesus says, I've had enough of your questions. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. 
And Jesus isn't trying to. I just want to make sure that we, we understand that, that earlier in this text, when the Herodians and the Pharisees are asking Jesus questions, they're trying to trip him up. They're, they're trying to, to uh, trap him in his own words. But Jesus isn't trying to ask a question that's going to trip them up. Jesus asks these questions because Jesus wants them to know the answer. Jesus has a desire to be known by them. And to not just be known on some surface level, but to really have them know who he is. And that's why Jesus ask these questions. So this isn't some sort of, of debate about, um, uh, you know, who can ask the, the hardest questions. This isn't, this isn't after Wednesday night and John sends the youth group down to ask me questions about Genesis that are almost impossible to answer, right? And I, they're all like, stand, there's like a group of them coming at me with these questions. So this, the, the goal here isn't to stump them. The goal is to enlighten them. Because he wants them to know the answer. And he knows that on some level, many, most of them don't understand the truth. So, I want to look at the questions. There's really two questions, and they make up one. But I want to look at, the, at them kind of individually. So look back with me in verse 35. So then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? So remember, he just got done talking to a scribe, right? The scribe comes and asks him what the most important commandment is. So that scribe is there. Other scribes are around. And now Jesus turns and asks them, why do the scribes say that the Christ, that the, that the Messiah is the son of David? And I don't know how you all did in school. Probably most of you did better than I did in school, but uh, I don't know if you ever remember having that moment where the teacher or whatever is asking questions and you don't know the answer, like, and, and again and again and again, and then finally you get one you know, right? And you're like, oh, me, 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 I got it, right? I finally got one, right? And, and then they inevitably they'll call on the girl who always knows all the answers anyway. If you're a teacher, stop doing that. If that kid finally raises his hand, call on him for Pete's sake. Anyway, that's just a thing from my past that needs to be resolved. But, but nevertheless, just because she always knows, give the guy a chance, right? But anyway, I think when, when Jesus asked this question, there's probably some scribes that are saying, oh, I know. I, I know why we call him the son of David. The, the, I can answer him using the Bible the same way that he's been answering us using the Bible. Some of these scribes are getting excited. Some of these scribes, are, their hands are probably shooting in the air. Pick me, call on me. I know the answer. Some of them probably would have read or quoted to them Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says this, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That rod from the stem of Jesse, that's talking about the Messiah coming from the lineage of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 15, this passage may have come to their mind. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and the blows of the son of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed before you. So they're talking about Solomon, but then ultimately for all of eternity that the kingdom would come from that lineage. And so some of them would have said, absolutely, the reason that we say the Christ is the son of David is because you, God, has promised that he would be. That he would come from that line. If you're, if, you're, if you're one of our Wednesday night people, you know that we've been studying through Chronicles and, and the kingdom of Judah and how that kept that, that messianic line to get to Jesus and the importance of that. And so some of them certainly would have had the answer. And, and if Jesus would have called on them, which he didn't, he just kept going. 
right? But if Jesus would have called on them and they would have given one of those answers, they would have given one of those verses, they would have been right. They would have had the right answer. They they would have not have been incorrect. But they would have been incomplete. Because you see what the scribes, what the Pharisees, what the religious leaders believed of Jesus, or not of Jesus, but of the Messiah, of the coming Christ, they were yet to believe that Jesus was that. What they believed about him was that he would be from the root of David, from from the lineage of David, that he would be an earthly king. And that he would rise up and that he would, he would assume power and he would reign and he would create a kingdom here on earth. Throughout the New Testament, what we see is even the, the disciples, later the apostles, were looking for that same thing. When are we going to do this? When do we get the swords out? When do we overtake Rome? When do we do these things? And so you see, they were, they were not incorrect, but they were incomplete in who Jesus was. At this moment, the only thing they believed about the Messiah was that he was going to be the son of David, right? Was that he was going to be of that kingly lineage of David. And I think even today, there are many people. First, let me say this. I don't don't profess to know and understand every single detail about Jesus, okay? My mind hasn't hasn't gotten around all of that yet, okay? But I do think that there are people today who believe truth about Jesus and they're not incorrect, but what they believe about Jesus is incomplete. He was a great teacher. He was a great leader. He's one of many that we should follow. Those people are close, but they're incomplete. And I I hope that even if that's you this morning, that today we would see who Jesus really is. So the first question is, Christ, David's son. How do they say that? Well, they say that because that's what the scripture says. Again, talking to a scribe, a scribe would be completely aware of what the scripture says about the the Christ, about the Messiah being the son or of the lineage of David. But then in verse 37, he takes his question just a little bit further. And this is where the scribes probably start to say, oh, well, you know, have you ever done that when, when you were in school? You raised your hand and then you're like, actually, maybe I don't know the answer to this. Right? You're like, I think I know. Actually, no, I don't know. Let's, you should call on that girl over there. She usually knows the answer, right? And then you're kind of hoping you don't. And I think that may have been what happened here. Look in verse 37. Uh, we'll just read 36 and 37. For David said, himself, David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. David calls him Lord. How is is he then his son? So now Jesus takes this question. One, you say that, that he is David's son, but David has called him Lord. How can he be David's Lord and how can he be David's son at the same time? How does that work? There are so many, we pro- I probably haven't even thought of all of the issues with that, but there are a lot of issues with, with, with the Messiah being the son of David and the Lord of David at the same time. So first, just in a, in a very simple understanding of this, it would have been inconceivable at, at that time, and probably really even today, but certainly at that time, and certainly of a man of David's stature. Remember, when we're talking about David, sometimes to us, Uh, David is just one of many biblical characters, right? He's just one of many men that we know about. But but the reality is, is when a Jewish person hears David, he is is hearing the king that that separated himself from all kings. He is is the, the highest, the greatest, the most powerful, the most beloved king that Israel ever had. Okay, 
So just think, think back about, about someone in your life, some leader, some person in your life that, that, that just always, when you, when you hear their name, you think positive thoughts, right? You think, you think good things about them. They would always have attributed goodness, righteousness, uh, well-being, all of those things, victory to David. And so they hear that David calls someone his son, Lord. No one, no father calls his son Lord. Okay? That, that word um, that, is, that is used there in, in, in the New Testament means authority. That it's kurios. Does the king have a kurios? Does the king have an authority? Certainly no one has authority over King David. And certainly not his own son. Never would he give his son or his descendant authority upon him. So it's inconceivable to them that David would call his son or someone in his lineage his Lord. So that's the first, the first question that they have to wrestle with when Jesus says this is, well, how would he do that? How would he submit himself to him? But the second thing I think is even probably more difficult to understand, and it's this. If in that passage of Scripture, in Psalm 110, we'll read that in a moment, but, but in that passage of Scripture, if David is talking about someone who is to come, right, and now these men are in the future, not like back to the future, but like in the, after David, right, David is dead, now these men are here, right, and they don't think that the Messiah has come, how could he be David's Lord if he hasn't come yet, Right? That doesn't make any sense. How can someone be your Lord who hasn't even been born, right? I mean, there could be a possibility where in some sort of family situation, you know, of of hierarchy or whatever, that the son rises to power and overtakes his father, you know? Solomon's getting getting a little bit more grown up. He thinks he's he's pretty, he went to weights all summer, you know? He's starting to think he can overtake his father, what he doesn't know is that his father will cheat and use every cheap shot, that he, he knows all sorts of things, right, that, that he will take him down, right? And so as maybe it's conceivable that a son could overtake and, and create authority over his father, but how could he possibly do that if he's not even here yet, right? This, this person that David is talking about is someone to come, and certainly in the minds of these scribes and these Pharisees, even when they look at Jesus, they don't believe, even today, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? They still think it's someone to come. How could he possibly be his Lord? And so that's the question that Jesus asks them. I know that you call the coming Christ the son of David, but how? How can David call that which is his son or his descendant his Lord when he certainly should have authority under him and he has not yet been born? And so this is the the predicament, this is the question that these scribes as a whole have. And I think probably, I don't know this for sure, but I think probably when they hear Jesus say, When they hear Jesus quote, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. They probably heard that and thought, well, I didn't think of it that way. What what do you mean, Lord and Lord? There's two Lords in there. What, What are you talking about? And so now they're questioning. And so Jesus gives the answer. And like he has before, He uses the scripture, again, speaking to the scribes who would hold the scripture higher than anyone else at the time. Jesus uses scripture to answer the question that he has asked. And that is the answer. That is the answer that he gives him. Verse 36 is the sum of the answer. For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Everything that we need to know to answer that is found in that verse, in those things. But the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus gives them uh, an answer, but that answer is verified truth, right? It's verified truth. We live in a day and age today 
um, that is much different than theirs. But certainly making sure that what you believe is true actually is true was important then as it is today, right? You can read all sorts of things. If it, listen, if you, want to, if you want to believe something, you can find someone else who believes it today. No matter how crazy, no matter how far-fetched, no matter how far left, right, north, south, east, or west, you want to be on whatever subject, you can find someone who says that it's true, right? You just have to Google it enough times and scroll down far enough to find this truth. And what we want to do as just everyday people is we want to verify that the things that we believe are true. But certainly, as believers, as those who are followers of Jesus Christ, we want to make sure that what we believe about the Bible is true. And throughout the Word of God, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a way to verify something was true. And it was to have a multiplicity of witnesses, at least three, if, if you could, more than that, uh, witnesses of something to be true. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, right? So uh, a multiplicity of witnesses gives us a better chance at finding out what is true. And so when Jesus quotes this scripture, he gives a multiplicity of witnesses to them. So it's a verified truth. First, this is a quote by who? Who wrote this in Psalm 110 verse 1? It's David, right? Who's going to argue with David? Again, you can argue with me all you want because I am not David, right? But none of those people would say, well, actually, David was probably off, right? He, he, he was a good king and all, and he was good at writing songs, but he probably, you know, he probably just put that in there because it rhymed, right? It, it made his song better, and so he probably just put, nobody's going to say that. If David writes it down, they're going to say, oh, well, we should probably listen. But I want you to even notice what Jesus says about this because this is, this is one of those reasons, this is one of those things like we have to see these things. Look what Jesus says. For David himself said, right? David said this, you should listen by the Holy Spirit. This is, this is a big implication. This is like, we don't have time to dive this far in, but... This is a bigger implication than just this passage of Scripture. What Jesus is saying is that this writing of David, this psalm that David wrote, is not just from David. It is the inspired word of God. He says David did not say this of his own thought, of his own heart. David said this by the Holy Spirit. This is God speaking here, not, not at a Southeast football game. This is God speaking, if you've ever been to one of those things, because that's obnoxious. But, right, this is literally God speaking. This is God speaking. So first, we have David. Who's going to argue with David? Second, we have the Holy Spirit. Who wants to argue with the Holy Spirit, right? So Jesus gives him two reasons to believe that this verse answers these questions. But then thirdly, where is, this, where is this kept? Where is this written? It's in the Word, right? It's in the Scriptures. These scribes would have known the Scriptures. They would have known this psalm clearer again than most anyone else of the day. Who's going to argue with the Scriptures? So now we have, now we have uh, David. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Scriptures. But finally, and I'm sure that they didn't care about this one, but we do. Finally, we have Jesus say this. Jesus says this is the answer. But I think maybe a little bit they would have given him, they certainly wouldn't have given him the credibility that we do, but I think they would have given him a little bit because do you remember that every time he, they ask him a question that they think they're going to stump him with, he answers and they're all amazed? They're like, this dude is always right right? Like we, we can't get one over on him for any, we're the smartest guys in town and he always seems to be smarter. 
So I think there may have been a level with them saying, well, he hasn't been wrong yet. We haven't been able to argue. Again, they don't believe necessarily who he is, but he hasn't been wrong yet. So what do we, what answers can we conclude about who Jesus is from this verse? Again, Psalm 110.1, this is what he quotes. A Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Direct quote from the Psalms. So I said earlier that when this was written in the Greek in the New Testament. That word Lord was kurios, which means authority. But when David wrote it in Hebrew, when it says, the Lord said to my Lord, he didn't use the same thing. If you notice, uh, is Psalm 110 still up there, Gav? Put it up there. If you notice when it says the Lord said to my Lord, do you notice that the Lord, the first Lord is in all caps and the second one is not? There's a reason for that. The reason for that is because David, the psalmist, used two different words to describe that we would then that we would then interpret as Lord. And when it's in all caps in the Old Testament, that is referring to the proper name of God, Yahweh. So when you see that, you know he's talking about Yahweh, the proper name of God, calling him out individually, the name is above all names, the I am, that Yahweh, that's what he is talking about. When you see the lowercase, that word, or not lowercase, but with a lowercase on the, the last part, it's not all caps. When you see that, that word is not Yahweh. That word is Adonai. So Yahweh is the proper name of God. So the same way that you would call um, you would call me Ben, right? That is my proper name. In fact, my lovely wife told her Sunday school class that my proper name is actually Benjamin, and now all of the kids call me Benjamin, which is I really appreciate. Uh, but anyway, right? So my proper name would be Benjamin, but then the title, Adonai, is the title of God. It describes who God is. It is his title. So the same way that I would say my name is Ben and I am a pastor. This is my name. This is who I am. But then this describes, this is my title. This describes who I am. And you could do that with lots of things. I could say my name is Ben and I am a husband. My name is Ben and I am, I am a father. I am a community member. I'm a pastor. I'm a whatever. I'm a coach, whatever you want to say. And it would describe who that person is. Why does that matter? It matters a lot, and here's why. Listen, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what this says about Jesus. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also made the worlds. Listen to this who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The express image of his person sits down at the right hand. What does a title do? It, it, is, it tells us who the person is. When I say I'm a pastor, you know something about me. When I say I'm a dad, you know something about that title. You know who I am, right? Jesus, the express image of God, showed who God the Father was in a physical, verbal form. And that set at the right hand of the Father. So when he says, the Lord said to my Lord, God, the Father, Yahweh, said to Jesus, his son, the title, the express image of his, of his self, said at my right hand. So what does that tell us about the answers to the questions? First, that there are two separate people being talked about, two separate persons, if you will, being talked about in this verse, God and God's son. It isn't God having a conversation with himself kind of is they're both god but either way right it's god the father speaking to god the son the second the first and the second person of the trinity talking okay so we know that there are two 
The second thing that it tells us is that Jesus is the eternal Son. The reason that David can say, my Lord said to my Lord, in that present time, even though Jesus hasn't been born yet, is because Jesus is eternal. Jesus was the Lord. Jesus was Adonai at that moment, even though he had yet to be, had yet to be born or come to earth. And so since he is eternal, David can easily say that Adonai is my Lord because he existed just as much when David wrote those words, sang those words as he does today. That also shows us that, that, that earlier when in, in, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, when it talks about the virgin birth, it confirms that that is actually what happened. Jesus didn't just appear on the scene. He wasn't created at his birth. Rather, because he's eternal, because he was David's Lord before he was ever born, he had to be born of a virgin because he didn't begin life at that moment. Do you see the implications of how big this is? So he is... He, he can call him Lord and call him son because he comes from David's line through his father and because he's the son of God because he's eternal. So both of those things are true. The second thing, first, is that it shows that he is two, uh, that there are two separate people being talked about. The second is that Jesus is the eternal king, born of a virgin. The third thing is that Jesus' resurrection is sure. Jesus has already told the people and will continue to tell those people that he's going to die. Remember, the title of our sermon series is Then Calvary. Jesus is going to Calvary. And if Jesus is going to Calvary, he's going to die. But if he is the eternal Adonai, his resurrection is sure. If his, if his kingdom is is without end. If he's going to sit at the right hand of the Father, he, he isn't going to sit there dead. He will sit there alive, right? And so if the promise is that he will sit at the right hand of the Father and the promise is that he will die, his resurrection is sure. And the final is that his reign is secure. Your enemies will be your footstool. Aren't you thankful that the reign of Jesus is secure? It seems like in the world that we live in today, very few things are secure, right? I have a, I have a retirement account, and most of you know I'm a pretty conservative person when it comes to those sorts of things, and so I have a very conservative retirement account, you know, and the idea was, well, I want to I wanna make sure that that money's secure, 21%, pew! Not so secure, right? We thought it was secure, not secure. Jesus' reign is secure. There will be no enemy who has ever or will ever overtake King Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Amen. The gates of hell will not prevail. They cannot prevail. His reign is secure because his enemies are at his footstool. Because he sits at the place of authority next to God. That's what the right hand means, the ultimate authority. So Jesus sits at authority. His resurrection is sure. His reign is secure. He is eternal. He is the son of David while simultaneously being the eternal son of God, being the Lord of David at the moment that David said it. So what does that have to do? One of the things that we've been trying to do in this sermon series is make sure that we don't grab a hold of a few verses and pull them out and say this this is the truth of them but rather do that but then put them right back into the context and say what does this mean within the context of this so look what it says in verse 37 therefore david calls him david himself calls him lord how is he then his son look what it, this next part and the common people heard him gladly there are great con context implications about jesus proclaiming these things and proclaiming himself to be the second lord of psalm 110 1 and the first is that some heard him gladly the 
the common people, they said. Praise God for that, right? This isn't necessarily in the notes or anything, but praise God that, that the good news of Jesus Christ is for the common people and not only for the elite, right? Because I don't know how you would classify yourself, but I am as common as they come, right? I praise God that he has called me out of my common death into a glorious light with him because he has a gospel that can be understood by children all the way through adults and the common people and not just those who seem to be elite. But some had a simple faith. Some believed this is the Messiah. This is the Lord of David. He is the Lord today and he will be the Lord tomorrow. There were some of them that grasped it. There were some of them that believed. And Jesus knew that many of them would not. Standing before the religious elite of the day, he knew that this would, would, would not only not be believed, but would fuel their fire toward their hatred to him. But here's what I want to get to. Here's why this matters in context. This, look back up in verse 34. Do you remember? I can't see if I put them on. Do you remember, this, do you remember the scribe that asked Jesus the question before? And agreed with Jesus' answer. Do you remember what he told him in verse 34? Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Why does that matter? What did we say last week? We said last week that he agreed with what Jesus said. Now he needs to agree with who Jesus is. He's not far. What Jesus is doing, I don't, listen, I don't know. I I don't know if this scribe believed, but I'm pretty sure he did. (laughs) I just can't hardly, I, I believe that in this moment, Jesus is effectually calling this scribe to himself, saying, I am the Messiah. I am Adonai. I am the authority. I will sit at the right hand of the Father. I will reign. I am the king. Follow me. I love that Jesus, Jesus tells this, asks this question moments after the scribe asks the question. And he tells him, you are not far. Jesus is making clear who he is. Why? Because it matters what the Bible says about who Jesus is. Amen. It matters for our eternal life that we believe not just in a Jesus, but in the Jesus. And here's the next context implication, and then we'll be done this morning. First, because there was one who was close to the kingdom, and he just needed to believe who Jesus was. The second is because this seating is close. When he says... The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. David says this hundreds of years before this moment. But when Jesus quotes the words of David, this seating is imminent. Jesus is days from the cross. He's, he, so he's a week from resurrection. So he's a month and a few days from his ascension and his sitting at the right hand. That's what it says in Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Like this that had been promised all the way back to King David, this that had been looked forward to from all of these, all of these generations, all of these centuries by the Jewish people, it was almost there. I just want you to get the anticipation that's happening. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to be buried. He's about to be resurrected. And when he does, he will reign at the right hand of the Father. And nothing in the world will stop it. It is a guarantee he will sit at the right hand of the Father. And it's almost time. So Jesus says, believe who I am. Don't believe in who you want me to be. Believe in who the Holy Spirit, who the Word of God, who King David, and who Jesus himself proclaims him to be, Adonai, the express image of the Father, his only begotten Son. 
believe on him today. I believe that's what, that's what he was telling that one scribe in that moment. And I believe that's his message to us today. Stop, believe, listen. If we want to make Jesus something other than what he is in the Bible, you will be disappointed. Certainly in the next life, but probably even in this one. This Jesus cannot disappoint. This Jesus is reigning. This Jesus is king. And he wants to be your savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we praise you. We praise you for sending Jesus to be the Messiah for his death, burial, and resurrection, we praise you that today he sits at your right hand and nothing will ever force him away. Lord, we pray today that we, as followers of Jesus, as believers in you, Lord, we pray that we would be hungry to understand more clearly every day who you are and who Jesus is. That as we mature in our faith, that, that the face of Jesus, the person of Jesus, would become more clearly and more clear and more clear as we go. Father, we ask that you would, you would build that desire into us to know him more fully. Father, we pray for those who are seeking after a Jesus who is simply not the Jesus of the Bible. We pray that, that through your spirit, you would call them to yourself and to the truth of who Jesus is. Father, we pray for anyone in this place this morning or within the sound of my voice this morning who doesn't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, who recognizes today that he is not their king, that they have not trusted him for salvation. Father, I pray that today would be the day they would repent, turn from their, 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 their sin and their self, and turn to Jesus for salvation. Father, we love you today. We thank you that you have loved us in such an amazing way by sending Jesus. And Jesus loved us in such an amazing way by dying for us. We praise you for that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.